without my scriptures, the, the, the notes. Um, isn't, that, isn't that good? But here's the scripture, because uh, I got it in the computer. If I can get it to come here for me. Um, we're reading from uh, oh. not do it there. Okay. <laughs> In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord gave him a vision. Ananias said, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said, told him, go to the house. Yeah, go to the house of, um, on Straight Street for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is, is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place hands on him for his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about him and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all those in your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen uh, vessel to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to um, people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house of, and entered in, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the, the way, the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, immediately something like scales fell off his eyes and... Um, Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. And, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Lord, I pray your blessing on your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, don't want to kill so I'll get the right one here. Okay, I'm, the reason I did, I'm doing this, I'm doing it on a PowerPoint this morning. So, um, from the beginning, there, we're going to make it now. Okay. Um, Acts. Message 22, the second, 22nd message we share. And what happens is when they, uh, Paul started to speak and share, and it said there was a fearlessness there because uh, the people he had in his heart to share, and uh, he, was, he was out to kill the Christians, so he wasn't afraid to share the gospel as well. Kind of like the Chinese that have been tortured for their faith, and the, but are making their way through many Muslim countries, preaching the gospel on their way to Israel right now as we speak. Uh, it said that they were astonished and they were baffled. And um, they set out to have an assassination. They, they decided that they were going to kill him. In an attempt to find an opening, uh, they found an opening in the wall. And so I want to talk today about the walls. Um, it's something really interesting that you're going to find. Uh, we read the text in Acts. Um, he was struck blind and uh, warned that he was going through the wrong door. And then what happened is um, he went and, and Ananias prayed for him and his eyes were open and he went on to continue to minister. And so I want to talk about walls and doors for a few moments this morning and you'll, you, it'll all come together when I put it together and I believe the Lord has a message for us today. Um, take time to look at the roles of walls for a few minutes this morning. Um, the wall, roles that walls play in our lives. In Turkey, um, we see this wall being built. 65 countries have created walls because of the refugees. They're creating walls so that people won't be able to get through them. Walls are there to, to uh, um, be a hindrance, to keep us out or to keep us in. And here's a Mexico U.S. wall being built and uh, check out the results. On the first try, these girls made to the top of the fence in under 18 seconds. <laughs> uh, but walls are being built and when we go down there, we see some of those walls that they built to try and separate the Mexicans from coming in, into, into the U.S. Uh, here's a fellow that was really an entrepreneur, and uh, this is a wall in Mexico, and he decided to take his Jeep over it. And uh, he was uh, kind, of, kind of got hung up there. <laughs> he had it on both sides, and he was going over, but you know, he, he thought that that was the way to go, and it, it wasn't the way to go. People trying to scale a wall in Mexico got top on this, stuck on the top and ran. Um, Mexico, we, we see the built, uh, walls in Mexico, so you see the walls in Israel. There's walls everywhere, around the world. We've got a great country of walls. Not only in Mexico is there walls, but everybody has um, barbed wire on top and at their homes, 
walls. And uh, my friends live in a place down there that minister in a larger church in, in Juarez. And they had walls, and they had huge walls, and then they had broken glass uh, cemented into the top of the walls. And people still got into over the walls and even broke into their house. And then they have bars on their windows. <laughs> so, I mean, they really try hard. And that's one of the things, all the windows that they make down there, it's not like up here, Hans. Down there, they all have to have bars. And after what happened this week in break-ins, we might, might want some bars in the family, too. But we have bars, but bars and windows. Other kind of bars. <laughs> uh, not bears, but bars. Uh, so this is some of the walls that we see. There's a memorial wall in Germany, uh, the Berlin Wall, you know, the, the wall that came down, and, and this is a memorial to that wall, and, and uh, they took a stand and said, take down that wall. And uh, the Iron Curtain came down, and the wall came down. Uh, here's the ancient world wonder that, that winds for more than 5,500 miles across China with towers and walkways. It's the uh, wall, Great Wall of China. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd want to join the tour group <laughs> and be on that wall. I would, I'd, be, I'd be afraid of the wall coming down with that many people on it. I think that's how the walls of Jericho came down. Everybody got up there for uh, seven days watching and laughing and mocking the Israelites when they're walking around. And, and every day they said, well, this is a joke. And the last day, uh, they went seven times. And the, the interesting thing is that they didn't argue, and they were in un unity, and they were silent. And can you imagine when, if, if, if I asked you to walk around Bentley seven times, uh, and, and God was going to do some blessing. Um, can you imagine the ones straggling at the back well, or the ones up at the front um, would start discussing? I don't know if this is, do you think he knows what he's talking about? Why are we doing this anyways? You know, the first day, second day, third day, the people, first of all, the people in, in Jericho were scared. Second day, they weren't just scared. Third day, by the fourth and the fifth day, they're, they're going, these guys are crazy. What do you think they're doing? And they're quiet too. And the seventh day, they went around, and they went around once, and they said, Hey, George! Hey, Pete! Hey, Sally! Get out of here! They're going again! The third time, the fourth time, pretty soon, I think everybody in the, uh, everybody in the, the city was on those walls. And isn't it interesting that when the walls came down in Jericho, they went down into the ground. And I think God uses um, some things that in the natural to help create it. But everybody was there mocking and taunting and making fun. And, then, and they, they weren't lifting off back then. They weren't going to say, ha, 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 we'll fix you. They just marched in obedience and silence. And they went around. And the seventh, they let out a shout. They blew the trumpets. And down came the walls. Well, this could happen here if they may shout it. How about the Wailing Wall in, in Jerusalem? Millions have visited it. They go there to pray. This is the wall that um, people, part of the old temple. And they go there to pray and uh, feel that somehow something good can happen if they, if they go there. It's in conflict with the Muslims, the Dome of the Rock is, is alongside of it, and sometimes um, the, the Muslims up in the top, uh, uh, not your normal, ordinary, down to, uh, you know, the guy that works downtown type, but the, the younger, radical people will throw rocks on the people down below, rocks and boulders and bricks. They come to worship with a brick in the pocket. Um, and, and they've got two or three bricks, and all of a sudden, they're flying over. And then Israel gets in trouble if they do anything back. I mean, can you imagine being down there praying, and all of a sudden, a brick's coming down at you? Uh, that's what they do. That's a wall there. And then the people leave their prayers written in the wall. Sometimes the stones are, uh, as I said, sometimes the thrown, stones are thrown down. But the people are squeezed into those cracks of the wall, leave those prayers. I'm so glad that God doesn't need us to go to Israel, to the Wailing Wall, to stick prayers in there. He, he's talking to us all the time. And we just call upon him. But this is some of the things that we see with walls. Walls keep us from something. Uh, we want to get in. We want to see what's on the other side. But walls keep us from something. Well, when you get to a wall, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to push or are you supposed to pull? I, I, I want to share a story with you this morning um, about uh, something that I saw. A week ago, Janet and I were praying in, at our, for our church, our family, our community, and God's church, and the Lord gave me a vision. This has not happened very often, uh, maybe a couple times in my lifetime. The Lord gave me a vision, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. It's all about walls. And in that vision, um, in the New Testament, we find in, in Acts, it says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. 
and your old men will dream dreams, so I'm going to stay be, still be young, because I had a vision. <laughs> it wasn't a dream, it was a vision. Uh, I'll stay young as long as I can stay young. And that's, this vision came to me. I saw a wall with many doors on it, and each one was different. And as I looked at it, these doors were there. there this is the wall, and, and there's the doors, and you'll see on the edge of those doors, there's hinges. The hinges are all there, there's handles. And so here's the wall that I saw, and I'm wondering, what is this all about? What, what are you trying to say, Lord? And, and I mean, this is really, really different. I never, that is not something that normally would happen. But as I was praying, the Spirit Lord came over me, and then I saw a picture of people trying to get through the doors. There they are, tugging on them, doing everything they can. You know, when the hinges are on this side, the door opens out, right? And so there they were working, doing their best to get through these doors. And I was wondering, Lord, what's, what's that all about? What, 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 is, what are we looking at here? And uh, people were trying to get through the doors open. They were frustrated, alone, or together. They were uh, wondering, what can we do? How can we get in? And so I looked at it, and here we see that the, um, the, the doors are there, and all were pulling on the doors. Everyone was pulling, pulling for all they were worth, trying to get those doors open. I wondered what were the doors? What was it all about? Lord, what are you saying? I saw frustration. I saw many people waiting. You know, when the doors are locked. Have you ever got somewhere um, on Wednesday? On Wednesday, I think it was when they, you did the, the uh, um, reads. Um, I talked. I talked to, to uh, the, during the week. They were going to do some 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 reads here, and uh, and then they they weren't going to come. And then I came, and there they were in the church. And fortunately, somebody had to push the door hard enough to lock it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Leslie and the crew got to come and came in and made Christmas wreaths. And um, so anyways, uh, but you know what it's like when you're waiting at church and nobody's there with the keys? Uh, well, these people, many, many people were waiting to get through these doors, but they couldn't because the doors weren't being opened. Then there became arguments. Uh, they were, do you pull the door or do you push the door? How do we get in? Do you push or do you pull? How do we get through the door? All the hinges, as I said, were on the outside of the door. And so I looked at this and thought, Lord, what, what is this all about? And, and uh, what's behind the great wall? There's a great wall and many doors. But what's behind it, Lord? What, what's going on? What's behind each door? People were trying and people have chosen doors. I spent time praying about the doors and saying, Lord, what are you talking about? What is this all about? I uh, really spent about a week on this. And, uh, and then it came to me as I was praying that, there were many, many more names that I could name, but the doors had different names. And so we see some of these doors, they're there. And, uh, but what the Lord spoke to my heart was, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What's behind the big door, the great door, the wall, and those doors is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We're doing our best in North America to, to dump the Lord, to get rid of things, uh, to, to downsize. Someone said, you can't say Merry Christmas because you're discriminating against people that don't believe in Christmas. Someone else said, I can't say Merry Christmas because I'm discriminating against somebody that's miserable. They don't want the Mary either. <laughs> you know, it, it gets ridiculous. But the kingdom of God is what's on the other side of that door. Everything the whole world needs is behind that wall. And, and you may not... Well, you need to really uh, weigh this, what I'm saying today, because this is as, as serious as I've ever felt in my ministry in 42 years. The kingdom of God is in his righteousness, and all the things shall be added unto you, is when we, we seek him first. What happens, we often seek so many things. There are so many things we're told to seek. Every advertisement on TV tells you, you'll be happy when you get this. You'll be happy when you get that. You'll, you'll, then you'll be fulfilled. You'll have everything you need. But we should seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I asked the Lord, how does this apply to us today? And um, it, it began to come to me, what do you want me to see, Lord? What do you want me to see in all this? Uh, then I started to realize what the, what the doors meant. And so I looked at the doors, and there they were. And uh, it started to come, and I just wrote down just a few of the things that the doors have, have means. Um, the first one we have is musical preference. Well, I'm not going to church that's going to have that uptight, up new music. Well, I'm not going to church if they don't have new music. I don't like country music. I think God wants us to be really, you know, and on we go with the preference, music preferences. Everybody has music preferences. 
My son with the boom chunk of voice, he never sang country. <laughs> he never sang country. Now he sings country. He used to sing rock. We have another one, the culture. The culture that we've raised in. Uh, there are things that, um, in some cultures, if you come to church, the men are on one side, the women are on the other. There's some cultures, when they eat, the women sit at one table, the men sit at another, and the children are in another room. That's culture. Well, I know it's right. Well, how do I know it's right? Because that's what I grew up with. And you know my favorite story is the, the fellow that got married and, and his wife cooked this nice sausage and she cut the ends off, put it, roasted in the pan, it was a nice big sausage. And so after she roasted it, he liked the sausage and said, Hi, honey, I noticed that you cut the ends off. And uh, how can you do that? She said, well, that's the way you do it. Um, there's, the men tie it on the ends and you want, don't want where they've been tied. And my mom always did it. So then when mom was over, she, he asked mom, how come you cut the ends off? She said, oh wow, there was always a little fat at the ends. So I got rid of the fat. And that's my way my mom, mom always did it. So grandma was over one day and he said, why did you cut the ends off? She said, oh, mercy's sake. She said, it was the only way that would fit my pan. <laughs> so three generations are doing it because it's culture. It's something they <laughs> learn. And so people are just fighting on this door of culture, the culture door. And then we have um, the door of hair. No hair, more hair, less hair. Well, how we do our hair? I grew up with that one. And you know, if you, if, if, if you had long hair, you were, well, you, you, people go through scriptures and tell you all kinds of things. But long hair, colored hair, whatever hair. But hair was a big issue in my family. My dad really was, it was a big issue to my dad. And, um, and then my sister taught me how to be rebellious. On the way to school, because I had this nice flip, you know? On the way to school, she combed it down. <laughs> and I go to school. But I had to put it back up when I got home because dad was really serious. So then I was really serious because that was something I brought up with. So then Janet really helped me out because I was so down on Ryan because he'd have green hair, he'd have no hair, he'd have long hair, he'd have short hair. And she's going, hair grows again. Don't worry about it. You want a relationship. But some people, it's about hair <coughs> in church. And then we see uh, some it's about the leadership style. Uh, dominating leadership style. Um, there's the Quakers, which we call the Shakers originally, and they would sit around in a group and they would just wait on God until someone started to shake. And then that was the one that had the word from God. Now, if we waited here, if I just said, uh, someone's going to have to give a word, you might all shake. <laughs> uh, but that was, their, their, that was how they were taught, the leadership style. You wait on, on the Spirit. Others go like, you listen to me, I'm the leader. And, and, and so leadership style, that's another door people are working on. Trying to get through and get everybody way through. The Bible translation, the King James only. So it's got to be King James. Because of, uh, and it's, a, it's kind of a, 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 a joking slam. They say, if it was good enough for Paul, it was good enough for me. Well, Paul didn't have the King James. They were in Hebrew and Greek and, and, and you know, like, um, and the Germans never had King James, and the uh, Swiss never had King James, and the Swedish never had King James, only the English had King James. So how can it be the only translation? When they translated into German, it came from the original. When it's Swedish, it went from the original. But you see people, I mean, there's ch whole churches that, that they live on that, on that teaching, and that's their door. And they feel that's the only door, we gotta stay there. There's the dress. Do you dress right? Do you dress? Well, it does, I'm glad you come. I'm glad people do get dressed. Um, my, <laughs> my, my uncle's brother, Marsh Ruffman, he used to travel across the country with a, with a trailer that folded down. This was back in the 40s, in the early 50s. And the set folded down, they had a church service, he was evangelist. But he was over and he, he, he spent years in Grand Forks. And that was when the Sons of Freedom were involved there in the Duke of Wars. And, uh, and he said, one Sunday, he said, this man and this woman that came into church, Walk over the pews to from right to the front, stood on either side of them, all dressed in their slippers. <laughs> That's all they had on. He just kept preaching. <laughs> he was quite a fellow. You see, um, we get the hung up on these things. There's also uh, the traditions. Traditions. Well, I like it this way. And this is my tradition. That's my tradition. And he said, you teach for commandments the traditions of men, not the doctrines of God. And so these are other doors that people get involved in. Or fear. People are, a lot of people live in fear, and nowadays it's a lot more fear. Uh, when you see these things happening in our community, uh, the break-ins and things like that, there's, there's uh, a lot more fear. Like I, the night after they broke into a number of stores, uh, I got up at 4 o'clock and just went for a little drive around town, just to check, make sure they weren't doing it again. Uh, I used to do that often. 
I, I do sleep, but you know, like, um, and if people just keep an eye on you, if somebody's going through that, I found out that someone goes through and drops papers off between three and four. So we'll have to talk to them. Please keep your eyes open to see somebody doing something downtown because a couple of weeks ago it was a drugstore. And so, but we can live in fear and that can be the door. We've got to get through that door or we're not going to be safe. And the last one we have here is the door of personal pride. And you know, a lot of people like that. It's just the way it is because I like it the way I like it. And you know, these are all doors, and they're not bad doors, but they're doors that people are trying to, you work hard to get through. And, and they couldn't get through. They're all pulling on the doors. This was taken two years ago with thousands lined up for the 450 food parcels. 100 people were dying. And this is in Damascus. Where was Paul? In Damascus. And this is, this is in, in Damascus. And this is what people are going through there in, in Syria. It's just unbelievable. Uh, like we can sit and, and, and wonder what we should do. But when you see this and you see what's happening, uh, it, it, is, it is just beyond, beyond anything we can see. So in Acts 19, uh, 9 19, Saul spent many, several days with the disciples in Damascus, the scripture says. And once again he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. He's preaching, and all those who heard him were astonished and asked. They, 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 they were interested in what he was saying. Um, isn't this the man? And why was he saying it? Isn't this the man who raised, raised half in Jerusalem among all those who call on, on his name? Here Paul was going there to take people to jail. He was in on people getting murdered for being Christians. And he's come there and he's preaching the gospel. And they asked the question, hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? And so there he was. They were kind of concerned. In verse 22, it said, Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Some of them weren't too happy about it because they, they were still waiting for the Messiah. They had killed Jesus. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned about their plan. And as he decided what to do, day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. Now Saul had come to be the killer, and now he's being haunted and hunted. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Oh, we're back to the wall. This is just the next scripture that we're coming to. And they, they lowered him uh, through an opening in the wall. So there is ways through the wall. And Saul had to find a way through the wall. And, and he, he was able to escape. So we're looking at the wall again, and this one... <coughs> They used to keep keep him from uh, them from from killing him. Now, what I want to share with you today in, in this message is it's a prophetic word. If you understand what a prophetic word is, something that God is showing, showing something that's coming. It's for the whole church. It's not just for us, not just for me, but it's a message that I will put on out on Facebook on, on uh, YouTube. But it's a message. I've talked to other pastors. They're sensing the same thing. We're always out in the lead of what God is doing. And this is a message God is trying to share with his church. And usually, some of it, you'll hear what I preach in the last, the last year or two. Uh, is, um, so I was asked the Lord what this was all about. And I began to see a few things of concern. Why, why would you show me this wall? Why would you show me this? And what I saw, first of all, is everybody feels that their door is the right door. I don't know if you've ever been there, but they all feel like it's, it's their door. It's the right door, the only door. Some feel that their door excuse me, is the only door. You can't come any other way. I'm still thankful that God is so much bigger than somebody's door. And so we look, we're looking at these doors. Lost that one. Some feel it's the only door. The people tugging on the handles are unaware of others. They're so busy trying to get through their door because it's the most important thing to them. The doors that are not able to handle all the people who need to go through into the kingdom of God, they're not big enough. And people are not seeking wisdom, simply works. They're doing their best to fight these doors open. Not bad people, because they're working for God. Here's a, a bus, that, and it, just like I showed you, okay? It's, a kind, uh, it's kind of like the refugees trying to get on the bus in Croatia. And now there's a million refugees who've gone into, into Germany. Can you imagine? We're talking 25,000, about a million are in Germany. And when you see what they're going through, your heart cannot help but be touched. And so, uh, but this is, you know, I mean, they, my friend um, Dave Wester used to say that in, in, uh, in um, Chile, I think it's Chile, um, it's the only airline you ever saw that had standing room only. They packed the plane full of, it was standing room, like you're on a bus, standing in the plane. 
And um, the only thing there is people didn't realize when you got on one of those planes coming to America, uh, everybody had an assigned seat. So he said we would wait, have coffee until everybody fought their way, run out of the runway, <coughs> fight their way out of the plane. But we know that if we have a numbered seat that we're going to get anyways. Uh, they didn't understand it. But people are desperate when they're trying fighting. It's not just like the Japanese. That's just a commuter train. But pushing. And now we see the, the things that are going on in the world. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear and as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. God is pouring out his spirit on the world. The crisis and the things that we're facing are not to get us down. They may look like they're getting down. But believe me, there's a message of hope in what the Lord has shown me today. And so we want to, we want to look at that message of hope. There's a whole host of hurting, suffering people who need to get through the wall. In Alberta alone, in the last six months, suicides, and you see the article I wrote, suicides have increased by 30% in six months. 100,000 people have lost their jobs this year. We're in, in crisis mode. Uh, just, just as long as our credit cards keep working, but they're gonna, and they keep sending them mail. Um, but I got a thing from Citibank, a uh, card saying if I want to borrow 2500 uh, please get back to them. I never even knew who Citibank was, well, I was, I never told them. Uh, I got a, 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 a MasterCard in the mail from Scotiabank. I don't deal with Scotiabank. It's a live MasterCard, I just have to call in and, and but you see, that's a trick because you can, people are, 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 are using that to keep going. But we are in problems in our province. And in province, uh, if you look at the price of oil, what's happening there, uh, we're in a situation where we need to be there for people. Uh, for many Christians, well, it won't, won't be the same type of joy that Christmas. Parents are hurting when children are hurting, and their children are hurting. You might not be able to get the things that we, you were able to get last year. We're in a time where there's, where there's loss, where there's, um, but there's a reason for the good news. Prayer, Lord, give, give me, give us a burden for the lost, and help me, help us to do our part in telling the good news. That's what it's all about, the Christmas message, is helping the lost. So the Lord said, that was a powerful message to the church. What I saw was prophetic words. What I saw was a powerful message. The people trying to get through the doors are not wrong because they're trying to get into the kingdom. They're trying to get through. But God, but God. Remember we said that as we go through the book of Acts? But God. God stepped in. He wants us to see something outside of our understanding. And I was, I mean, I was in tears, but it also thrilled me when, it, when the revelation came. And I think it, it is so powerful because uh, he showed me that the wall of doors, I then saw, and then I saw the truth, the truth of what, what it was all about. You see, there's a hinge on the inside of the wall. There's a hinge. There's all these little hinges on the outside that people are pulling, trying to get the doors open. It is a door. That whole wall is a door. As long as we're pulling, it will stay solid and close. But when we begin to push, the whole wall swings in, and there's room enough for everyone to come through. That's what God is saying. The wall has to move. We've got to quit trying our individual doors. Join together, whether it's in our family, in our church, in our community, in our country. When we start working together, the wall will move. And there will be enough room for everybody to get in. I couldn't find a swinging wall picture, but here's the real key is everybody joining together. These are the guys pushed the wall over. <laughs> they got together, it's called the wall pushing over. They pushed it over. But you know, that's what God is saying. If we'll get together, if we'll get together, if we'll help one another, if we'll pray together, if we'll support one another, the wall will come down. Starting off in the book of Acts, the New Testament church, we've been going through it, and we have it all on DVD if you want to pick them up and listen to them, watch them. The believer, believers wanted to share what they had. It said there was no one needy in the church. They were in crisis time, but there was no one needy in the church. Why? Because those that had extra took and shared it with those who were in need. There was no one needy in the church. And that's what God is saying for us today, that uh, all the believers in Acts 4, 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Well, that's what it used to be like in, in, our, in our community, where somebody was going through things and, and people rallied around and people helped. Farmers helped one another, uh, with, and, and we saw that when the little girls were killed out in, in, uh, in um, Withrow. Uh, the next morning, uh, 12, 10, 12 farmers showed up with all their equipment and took the crop off. You see, that's what it's all about. We need to help one another. 
Jesus prayed, and this is something that I've shared with you many times. Jesus prayed, and what he prayed was a prayer for all believers. The prayer he prayed went like this. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. That's us. That's us. Even though it was 2,000 years ago, he was praying for all of us that would believe in this, their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. He went on to pray that, and this was a, a, a powerful prayer before he went to the cross, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That is Jesus' prayer. That is the, the Lord's prayer that we, quote, we recite is really a prayer for the disciples that the Lord gave. But this was the Lord's prayer before he went to the cross. That they be one. They all of them may be one. That they may be one. That they may be brought to complete unity. How are we doing? How is it going out there? How's the unity going? We need to continue to pray for the United Church because that meal has fallen through. And we just need to pray that God will bring somebody there that will use that for the glory of God and, and to encourage and, and be a blessing to our community. Here's the walls of Jericho. A picture of, the, of the, how they, they dug away from the walls of Jericho. When we look at that, is unity impossible? Impossible, you say? Unity, working together? Well, Jericho was impossible. So was Goliath impossible. So was the Red Sea impossible. The Jordan River was impossible. Being surrounded by 185,000 Syrians was impossible until they were all killed that night by one angel. A fiery furnace that they were thrown into was impossible. A lion's den was impossible. On everything God did in the Bible was impossible. So don't be discouraged if it's impossible. God is of impossible. He is up and possible. He's the one who will carry us through. It is so exciting. I mean, I got excited too because this was a shock to me but as I started to look at it. And so then I read in, in Psalm 133 earlier this morning, the song of Ascent from David, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in Amen. unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessings even like evermore. Where does he bestow his blessings? Verse 1. When brethren dwell together in unity, people live together in unity. That's what God's calling us to in our community, in our church, in our families. Um, the battle in, is unity in God. To God's community. Uh, it's a battle like never before. I've never seen a battle like this in all my years of ministry. The battle is unbelievable. People are filled with fear, but not identifying as the enemy. They're fighting to get, it, the, get uh, the door open, but not open to God to counsel. They're hiding from what God is trying to say because they don't realize we need to come to Him. Proverbs 13 10, 10 says, Where there's strife, there's pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. God is saying, it's time to look at my word. It's time to care for one another. And if, if our church is blessed, do you know that every church in this, in this area is blessed? If our church is struggling, do you know that every church in this area is struggling? You see, the Bible said we're all a body. We're a body. And if one member suffers, we all suffer. We haven't got it. We haven't got it. He's saying, it's time to get it. You're all working on your own church door. We're all working on that. He said, there's wisdom found in those who take advice. Three years ago, the Lord put on my heart to write, There is Hope. I've now written 1,138 articles. But I said, and I shared with you that in our country, there's a couple things that the enemy wants, and this was revealed back in the, in the late 70s, from the mid 70s, personal peace. I don't want to be bothered with other people's troubles. I just want personal peace. Don't let, let, don't let them affect me. If my neighbor's hungry, that's too bad. I really, we'll pray for them. Well, how about taking groceries over? How about helping them? Personal peace, I don't want to get involved. And the other thing, people are looking for answers. They're, they're searching for answers. And it's not the personal peace, and it's not the affluence. Well, as long as I can keep buying stuff, I'm okay. But you know, there comes a point where we've got so much. What's one of the greatest businesses today is, is storage units. Because <laughs> we've got so much stuff, now we have to rent storage units to store everything we've got. How about people that might need stuff? I, it's, start, it's time to start giving stuff away. It's time to start blessing people. It's not our personal peace, not our affluence. 
Pulling in is not the answer. We'll never get the doors open by pulling. The doors will open. I mean, you can talk for all your worth. And, and it's an interesting thing. As people are trying to push the wall and someone's pulling on the door, we got a problem. We got a problem because the door can never swing as people are pulling on the door. And that's what God is saying. It's time to quit pulling on the doors. Five issues I see the wall, uh, I see to see the wall move. One, faith in God and our personal invitation to the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts, born from above, born, reborn of the Spirit, inviting His presence into our lives. He doesn't come in by Himself. He doesn't just show up there. We say, Lord, all we do is say, Lord, I invite you to come and live within me. I don't have to go to the wailing wall to find you. You're in my heart. And He said, He would not only be with us, but He'd be in us. But He doesn't push His way in. Because that wouldn't be God giving us freedom. Freedom is our choice. So first, faith in God and our personal invitation. Acknowledging that we're not going to make it through the door on our own. Saying, Lord, I, I, I'm doing my best, but I'm failing. Lord, I surrender my will to you. Please come in first. Number two, walking in forgiveness so we can push together. No one can do it alone. If we don't walk in forgiveness, if there's brothers and sisters that we don't forgive, um, then, then we're not working together in the wall. The wall needs to move, but it's going to take us walking in forgiveness. Letting go of the hurts, the pain, the things that people have done to you. Blessing those who curse you. Uh, not returning evil for evil, but returning blessing for evil. Making prayer and reading God's word. Daily feeding, eating. Uh, when I, it was a year ago last Sunday, uh, on the 6th, I went in for my surgery, and I'm very thankful I get to live again, again continue on. And I went in for surgery, and um, out of that I started, I was sitting there, because you know I'm always on the go. And I started sitting there, and so I started a prayer journal on my computer. I now have a year's prayers every day. You're a part of it. I go through, it takes me, uh, with my scripture reading and my prayer, it takes me about an hour to go through. But that's the most important thing for me to do now. That's the most, and then Janet and I pray together. So we get up early, she gets up, and then we do a devotional together and we pray before I go off onto the bus. I'm going to tell you today that we're not going to survive in what we're facing if we don't start doing that. We're not going to survive. We're not going to survive. It's, it's, it's going to get worse and worse. But if we're doing that, and, and everyone, you know, I've got on a computer, okay? But that's what the war room was about, the movie. Having, she just had a closet she went into. It's having a place, a time where you just talk to the Lord and you, and you strategize. Our strategy has to come between us and God to start with. Fourth, not forsake, forsaking the meeting together. This is a sad part because people are going like, I don't need church, I don't need to come together. Uh, we do. We need to come together to stand with one another. And number five, not giving up when it takes too long. Or, and trying to do other ways. And we see that in Abraham and Sarah. Um, they were nine, uh, she was 80 and he was 90 and they didn't have children. So they said, well, why don't you take my hand, maiden? And they did. They got, had Ishmael and now we have the whole Arab crisis because Ishmael was a descendant of Abraham. Because uh, 10 years later, then God answered, he was 100, she was 90, and they had Isaac. You see, if we give up, and it's, it's so easy, I understand, it's so easy. I mean, I, I've been promising uh, for, for 28 years that God is doing something here. And, and I promised this year, and not just promised, but God gave me that, uh, that little quote, of the hand of the Lord will be seen in 2015. And I'm telling you, uh, it hasn't looked like that. Here's a group of leaders standing to the wall to pray. And, uh, and that's what God's calling us to do. Leaders, to everyone. Can God do anything good when it doesn't look like it's happening? Grass always looks greener on the other side, doesn't it? But can God do anything good? Yeah. Well, I want to tell you, in the natural, it has appeared impossible in this year. Anything but God. People have checked out uh, the hands of the Lord to be seen, and, and, and we're seeing people just going like, I don't see his hands, I don't see anything, uh, I'm discouraged. And so do not become weary and well doing because in due season, what is due season? That's not the season I said. I would have had due season a long time ago. How about you? <laughs> Aren't you ready for due season? <laughs> in due season, you'll see a blessing if you don't get discouraged and give up. But due season is due season by God. I want to share a little story with you this morning. After the vision, the Lord gave me a practical demonstration. It happened in Bentley this week. Um, he said he was going to show his hands. And we've been talking about, and all the talk is about the refugees and everything. So a week and a half ago, I went to Ministerial and Rob Killens Bell, uh, from the pastor of the Baptist Church, shared that they were concerned. And they decided, they got a group together, and they decided that they would uh, look at bringing some refugees over. And what they decided to do is to go into, into uh, Lebanon, because 
uh, thousands, 30,000 Christians have fled into Lebanon from Syria. And Damascus, some of it, we would come from. And they're in Lebanon on the streets. They don't go in, dare go into the Muslim um, uh, refugee camps because the Muslims and Christians just don't get along. And there they are living on the streets, and many of them are suffering greatly. And so they said, we decided to talk about it and said, well, well, we need to look at people that we can bring over. And so the Cohen Baptist Church with some others are looking at bringing two to two to four families over to the Cohen. And so he shared that, and everybody said, that's nice, you know. And he thought maybe people would be a little more excited at the ministry, or maybe people would say, hey, we'd love to help you. So anyways, I told a little bit of this last Sunday. Uh, it comes up to Friday, it was a busy week, and I had the funeral, and a lady came by, and she uh, talked with Loretta, and I got her number, so Friday night I phoned her, she said, I, I have a problem, my son is going through a, a tough time in Edmonton, he's uh, had uh, brain surgery some time ago, he was doing well, but he's not doing well now, I need to just clear out, get out of Bentley, and move in with him. She said, do you know anybody that could just take all the stuff in my apartment? And I thought, oh, okay, um, I've been down this road before, I, you know, sometimes, sometimes when people offer stuff, it's a garbage haul. You know, and you just go, I thought, well, I'll talk about it. Uh, could I come and see you? Well, I went over there. That's such a delightful lady. Her name's Robin. And, um, and I went in and I looked around and she showed me. She hadn't even used her toaster oven yet. The microwave, her bed was in a year old. Uh, Ikea tables and chairs and leather loft seat. And everything was just beautiful. And the cupboards were full of pots and pans, dishes, cutlery, and she said, I just want, I phoned a number of people in Red Deer, nobody's call, calling me back, and she said, I went down to the uh, Blue Light Liquor Store, and she said, I was in there, and I said, we're getting some boxes, and she said, I asked, I asked Annie, do you know anybody that could help me? And she said, call Pastor Greg. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, um, so, so I went over, and she said, she told me to call you, so I went over and said, yes, we will do what we can. I have to get back to you. I want to phone Baptist Church. And so I phoned Pastor Rob, and he, and he was leaving Monday morning for Lebanon. He's there right now. I said, could you use an apartment full of stuff, everything that someone will need to set up a family coming over? He said, well, let me get back to you. And he said, uh, yes. He said, we got some space in the church where we can store it. And he said, uh, I said, well, good. You can come over and send some people over. And uh, she said, could someone help me a little bit packing? And uh, I, I said, well, you can come over, and uh, you're welcome to get it. I thought, I'm free. And they said, could you find someone to pack it? <coughs> and so I was thinking about what to do, and I called Margaret and Lori. And they're here this morning. And they came over Monday morning, packed it. We got it all packed up. And Lori went to work cleaning cupboards. And uh, we got it all packed up. And... Uh, and we got to pray with her and love this lady, and she was in tears. And um, anyway, so we, we uh, then I got all the Baptists, and Dave came with his truck, and the Baptist fellow came in, in a little trailer. And Tuesday morning, we're, I know there's a storm coming in, I'm going, oh Lord, this is not good. This is not good. They got it all loaded and moved to the Baptist church before the storm got there. And it's all sitting there now. I estimate, just a rough estimate, Ten to fifteen thousand dollars worth of goods she gave. She's thrilled because now she's going to be with her son, and and we just moved on quick. I said we saw a miracle happen in Bentley. I mean nothing short of a miracle. I mean that is. I mean if you had to set somebody up and go out and buy all those things, you'd be looking at about fifteen thousand dollars and a lot of work and a lot of effort. And so I said you can tell your church you guys are on the right track because God just gave you a miracle. And so they're part of the miracle. We're part of the miracle. I just go, wow. The hands of the Lord will be seen in 2015. Where are we right now? Where are we? 2015? Did we see the hands of the Lord? Yes. She wrote me this last night. You asked me for an updated document on my family donation to the local Baptist Church, a Syrian refugee project, project and I certainly will provide that. But not yet. I have been too busy moving my personal stuff. When I get to it, I will. it will be document number three, 33. She sent me a whole document of everything she had. I drove to the, on Thursday in that snowstorm as you did the red here. I unloaded my van and unpacked some of it. Friday I rose and unpacked everything and put it away. Ha ha. There's no trace of me moving into the next house. 
No boxes, no nada. <laughs> uh, I returned to Bentley this afternoon and worked for a couple of hours reloading the van. We'll finish that up tomorrow and we'll be ready for my amigo from Spruce School to pick up the few larger items that I want to keep on Monday morning. We will be on the road shortly after lunch at the cafe, uh, at the cafe where, lunch at the cafe where Marvin Laurie and I had coffee. What a day that was. Cross that draft. <laughs> and uh, we'll keep you posted and send you an update, the updated document as soon as I can. I wish you all good things always. Best regards, Robin York. So that's what happened in Bentley this week. God said, I can do it. We need to come to God and realize we're, we're, we're in a, a difficult time. We could be fighting the door. Bill 6, people are fighting suspicious anger, hatred, attacks. Dr. Jerry Falwell Jr. said we need to arm ourselves and shoot, shoot the Muslims before they shoot us. He's telling all the people in his university to carry sidearms uh, and concealed weapons. Go like, that's kind of not what Jesus said. The word says love your enemy and speak the truth in love. Doesn't mean you don't speak up when we, we don't agree with things, but put the sword away and start going out to help people. More time praying than protesting, and we'll start to see things happening. That's us working together. I want to close with a farm story, and it's a very touching story. Um, years ago, because we got to deal with the Bill 6, years ago, there was a farmers that were doing some, some harvesting, and a little toddler got out of the house. And the toddler slipped away, and they came and couldn't find the toddler. You know, you think somebody else is looking after him and everything, and they're panicking. Now it's, it's night, it's getting cold, and they're all running around, frantically running around. Everybody was called in from the harvest. They're all running around looking for this toddler. And, and this is a true story. They're running around looking for the toddler, and they couldn't find this toddler. Panic was setting in, and you know what panic sets in, what can you do? And uh, finally someone said, listen folks, come on in here, we've got to talk. Let's get together, let's join hands and walk across the field and do it that way. They got way out in the field and then they found the toddler, but it was too late and it died. And the person cried and said, would to God we join hands sooner. Would to God we join hands sooner. What are we going to do about this today? God wants us to push the wall, not pull it. We are in the wall with the spirit that's within our hearts to agree in prayer. That's why prayer is so important. We're in a time where we won't get through it if we don't pray. We're in a time when, but when we do pray and we come together, that old wall is you might go and it will open up and there's enough room for the world to come through. But we're the key. Tugging or joining together and just pushing against that wall. Say, Lord, I see the vision. The wall, it's not the doors. The wall is the door. The hinge of the wall is on the inside so you can't see it. But God, let me see that the hinge is there and the door will swing open. And that means us praying for one another, praying for other churches, blessing one another, being there to support one another. Pray for others and God will listen to you and bless them. Don't forget that when we are safe and happy, someone somewhere has prayed for you. Father, I pray today, as you have given me this message, this truth, Lord, is so important, that, Lord, we get so caught up in tugging at our doors and thinking that we have the right door, and realizing even if we get it through, we couldn't push everybody through it. It's not big enough. But, Lord, you want us to see the bigger picture. The wall is the door. And if we'll reach out and if we'll push on that wall, we'll see it swing open. I pray, Lord, today that we'll start with realizing that we need your Spirit in our hearts. And we invite your Holy Spirit to come in now, to speak to us, to talk to us. We don't have to go to the Wailing Wall. We don't have to run all over the world. We invite you just to, we surrender the fact that we can't make it on our own. It won't be our talent. It won't be our ability. It won't be our strength. It won't be the horses and chariots. It'll be the name of the Lord and our trust in you. And Lord, we ask you today to help us to walk in forgiveness to see the bigger picture, to work together, to pray together, to support one, one another, to encourage one another. And Lord, I pray that this vision today will speak to our hearts. And when we get trapped into someone asking us to help tug their door open, we'll say, hey, hey, I got an idea. Let's just pray together that the big door will open. 
Now everyone here knows there is a big door. And as this message goes out, Lord, I pray that everyone across the country will get grasp this message. Lord, it's your word to the church today. This is a big door. And you want it to swing wide, swing open. As, the, as Canada, we're opening the door wide to many people. There's fear. Yes, there's fear. But Lord, when we see what people are going through, we must overcome the fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. Let us quit complaining and criticizing. We pray for our government in our province. We pray for our government in our country. We pray for the world leaders, Lord. It's crisis and turmoil. No one knows which way to turn. He said, Lord, the last days, men's hearts will fail them for the fear of the things that are coming. But Lord, when we have your love, we don't have to have fear. Because the worst that can happen to us is that we die and we're going to be with you. So, Father, we thank you that we can walk. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Take your word, Lord, this message I pray, and speak to people's hearts in the way that you want to. Whatever you want to say, Lord, I know that it will touch them. And we'll give you praise now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that as we as a church lean on that door, it will swing open. It's swinging open for our whole community. And, Lord, as we pray for one another, the enemy try to stop us. But, Lord, we're not going to quit praying. We're not going to quit because things go sour. Things turn against us. We're going to say, wow, we're on the right track. We're on the right track. We're going to keep going. And Father, as we do, as we pray together and share together and help one another, Lord, we're going to see the goodness of the Lord. You promised that the scepter, the authority of wickedness, will not remain over this community, over our family, over our church, over our province. Father, it will not remain. We pray that, Lord, because you said if it does, then good people will be doing wrong things. And well, part of that is trying to pull the door open. But Lord, you said that you, you will do good to those who are good. And Father, we thank you that as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds those who put their faith and trust in him. And that as that we, like Zion and Mount Zion, will not be shaken. Those who have trusted the Lord are above Mount Zion and not be shaken and remain forever. Thank you for the assurance that's ours today, Lord. I pray that you just spark faith in people's hearts now. And Lord, as they pray, when it looks impossible, as they pray, everything was impossible. But God, you are the God of the impossible. If it's possible, we'll do it. But if it's not possible, you can do it. And Lord, we pray for Robin today as she shared. And what a blessing, Lord, that you, and we told her that we pray. We pray with her and, and, and continue to support her. We'll keep her in touch. Father, we pray for her son. And she made that commitment to be there for her growing son. And Lord, to, to stand with him. Lord, I pray that your healing power would be there as well. Lord, that you would just minister to her. Even as she travels, even as today, Lord, that your blessing be upon her. And thank you for the gift that was there to teach us a lesson. This is what you can do as we put our trust in you. Now may your grace and your peace and your mercy be upon us. And may we have enough that we can share with others. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> That's it. Now you can go have coffee and fellowship. And uh, just know that you're the first ones that got to receive that. And I think it's pretty exciting to <laughs> say. I really do.